Okay, great. Welcome everybody. My name is Lisa Salisville and I'm with Vermont Coverts. And just so you know, you're in the right place. We're doing a Zoom tonight a presentation on Lamontria, if I'm saying it right, Dispar Dispar, which is uh, most of us have known as the gypsy moth in the path, past and now LDD. And we're here to learn a little bit more about this creature. The last outbreak I think was 1991, uh, the last big one. And uh, so we've had a big one here in 2021 and, and it's a little overwhelming, a little like, oh my gosh, what's happening? So we wanted to share that information and get it out to all of you so you can feel a little less stressed about it. Uh, tonight we have with us Judy Rozovsky, who is the state entomologist and Kathy Decker, who is with Forest Parks and Recreation. So we're gonna hear a little bit about the insect and its effect on our forests. And both uh, women will share a little bit about what they do and kind of where they're associated with. And I'm gonna turn it over to Judy in just a second. Uh, if you would keep yourselves muted so we don't have background noise, if you have any questions, go ahead and type them into the chat box. And at the end, we will um, ask the uh, any questions and uh, we'll go from there. So thank you very much and Judy, take it away. Okay, thank you. Let me just share my screen. And come on, buddy, cooperate. Here we go. Whoops, yeah, it started on the wrong slide. There you go, love that. All right, so um, I'm here tonight to talk about the um, insect formerly known as the gypsy moth, and we now refer to it as the Lymantria dispar dispar or the LDD. Um, and I am speaking. Uh, as the uh, state entomologist, I work with the Vermont Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets. And then um, after I discuss the insect's life history and other information, I'll turn it over to my colleague and friend, Kathy Decker, who works with the Agency of Natural Resources. Um, and I believe we're saving questions for the end, although I suppose you could type them in any time and um, we'll go from there. So thank you for coming. So the first thing to start with is explaining what's going on with the name of this insect. Um, uh, it's been known as a gypsy moth, but the word gypsy is actually a pejorative term for the Romani people. And um, the Entomological Society of America has actually started a project called the Better Common Names Project to um, uh, kind of weed through and uh, fix some culturally insensitive names. Um, so until a new common name is chosen, we are referring to um, insects in these situations by the initials of their Latin names. So this is Lymantria dispar dispar. So that's how I'll refer to it, except when I forget, because I've studied this insect for many years and I may or may not remember to call it its new name, new temporary name. Uh, okay, so um, what are, Lymantria dispar dispar. Um, they're a moth uh, shown here in this picture in their caterpillar or larval form. So they're animals, they're in the phylum arthropoda, the jointed legged organisms. Um, they're insects. They're in the order Lepidoptera, which is moths and butterflies. And many of you may know this, but some may not. They've recently undergone another name change where they used to be known as the Lymantridae. Um, and now they are a different name, the Arabidae. Arabidae? Yeah, okay. You can tell I've pronounced that very often. Um, and then their species name is Lymantria dispar. And as you may remember from introductory biology in high school or college, um, a species name is a genus name and the species name and it, it's a unique um, identifier for a given species of whatever organism it could be. So every organism on the planet that we've identified has a species name that's a genus and species. And if there's a subspecies, which is variants of those species, then they have a trinomial. So we have LDD for Lymantria dispar dispar because there are uh, two other subspecies, Lymantria dispar asiatica, which is the Asian gypsy moth, also undergoing a name change. And um, there's a Japanese um, Lymantria dispar. So, um, I hope that clarifies what all is going on and what we're talking about um, when we say LDD. So now that you know all about the name of this insect, let's talk about where it came from and why it's here. And I'm gonna digress a little into the history of this, which I hope I'm not geeking out. I couldn't quite tell. You'll tell me, <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, so the um, European Lymantria dispar came from uh, uh, mostly Russia, but it's very hard to distinguish Lymantria dispar dispar from the other uh, Lymantria dispars, especially Asiatica. So this range um, may include some of the other forms range. This is just showing a bird's eye view of Europe. And um, I think it gets into a bit of North Africa. Um, and the way it got from there to here was this gentleman, uh, Trouvelet, he was an astronomer and an artist, and he um, was clearly an entrepreneur too. And he brought gypsy moth over to Medford, Massachusetts, because he was looking for something that would um, be a good competitor of, or a alternate producer of silk um, rather than the silk moth. Um, and some of these insects, he had them in netting in his backyard and they got out, that was in 1869. And his neighbors complained about him sometimes, but people really complained in 1889. And as you can see from the less leftmost map, um, they have expanded a great deal since they got here, although not as much as the emerald ash borer has, so we're lucky that way. Um, yeah, so you might want to go to this website that I have under his picture because he did some very unusual um, celestial artwork in addition to um, bringing in this plague of um, defoliating insects. Uh, so, um, Silk was actually in some towns in New England was an important economic factor. And, um, but we weren't always competitive with other uh, international sources of silk. The equipment used to process the silk was not necessarily avant-garde. Um, and apparently um, Bombex mori, the silkworm moth are persnickety and difficult to rear. Uh, they eat mulberry leaves. Um, and so there are various reasons in addition to um, uh, having a local source of the insects, um, why um, Trouvelet would have been interested in, in producing a different form of silk. Um, and this is just to show you how, how they did silkworm or silk production in Japan. These are called gashu houses. They have those thatched roofs and the family lived on the first floor and the second floor would be a factory. So in this case, it was a silkworm rearing location. And you can see they have these little models of the silkworm on mulberry leaves, and these are the cocoons. And I believe it takes 3,000 cocoons to make one pound of silk. And then you can see the um, baskets over on the right of the actual um, silkworm larvae on the mulberry leaves. And then this is a model um, shown close up of the silkworm moth. So um, <laughs> for whatever reason, um, this is a picture of the neighborhood in Medford where Trouvelet lived and had his lab and his little pesty friends. Um, and these trees are not leafless because of the caterpillar. It just happens to be winter. But I thought that was a good representative photo. Um, so when that outbreak happened in 1889, both the town and the state um, uh, made a massive effort to control it to eradicate the insect. Uh -oh. Am I frozen or is Judy frozen? Must be me. Shoot. I, I don't know who's frozen. Oh.
just to test if everybody's frozen. Can anybody hear this? Yeah, I can hear you, John. I can hear you. We lost Judy completely. I think we might have lost Judy completely. She's not showing up on the participant screen. Yeah. Okay. Um, Kathy. <laughs> 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 I was just going to say, do you want me to call Judy and tell her like we were missing her? Uh, she probably has figured it out by right now, but if you can text her, that would be good. And then if you want to share your screen and kind of start, we can okay. jump back to her if she gets back on. Oh, wait, no, nope, that's not her. Oh. I don't think. Sorry, everybody. Technology is good and bad all at the same time. Yeah, give me, just give us a little quick sec, see if I can grab her. All right, I'll do a commercial. So let me tell you a little bit about Vermont Coverts. Uh, Vermont Coverts uh, Woodlands for Wildlife is an organization uh, many of you are part of uh, that uh, works with landowners about uh, educating about forest management and wildlife stewardship and also connecting each other through a peer-to-peer -peer network. Uh, we're really excited to be starting a mentoring program in, uh, that we're working on now that'll kick off in 2022. So if anybody's interested in being, um, we'll have an application process because we only have so many slots, but if you're looking for a mentor, uh, it's really someone to share information. They're not going to tell you what to do with your forest. They're going to share what they do with their land, um, and resources that they might be able to direct you towards, such as um, that they've used, such as NRCS or something along those lines. So if you uh, are interested in that, go ahead and email me. I'll put my email in the chat. It's lisa at vtcoverts.org. And um, so that's one thing I can do a, uh, let's see what type it in there, uh, a commercial on. The other thing I can do a commercial on is uh, we will be having our, uh, we're calling it Crawling Out of COVID event. It will be an in-person event on September 25th uh, down in Shrewsbury. Uh, we'll be having some information going out on that for registration very soon. Uh, if you sign up on the e-news on our website, uh, you will be able to learn more about that event and how to register if you're not already a cooperator. All righty. I got a thumbs up from Kathy. All right, Lisa. I think um, uh, I, so. I did talk to Judy. Her power went out, so ah. I don't know if she'll be joining us back. But um, I can jump to my information and stuff, and we'll just go from there. That sounds great. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, hold on. Oh, hold on. What happens, I have several screens open and didn't really need to share the, um, uh-oh. With my, <laughs> where my play button go? So go down to the bottom. See the one that looks like a little TV on a stand? Okay, you got it. All right, is that You're good? Can everybody see that? Okay, awesome. Um, Okay, so yeah, my name's Kathy Decker. I work for the Department of Forest Parks and Recreation. I'm the Forest Protection Program Manager and forest protection covers both forest health and fire. Um, this Today I'm gonna wear my forest health hat and talk about some of the impacts that we uh, might expect to see from this particular defoliation event from Lymantria Dispar. So the things I'm gonna to touch on are some of the impacts directly to trees, um, some of uh, the dynamics of what might change in the forest, <clears throat> also some impacts on wildlife, and of course, um, people. So tree, individual trees, um, again, you may know a lot about trees, or you may know a little about trees, so I'm gonna cover some Sometimes some basics that that might you already know about, but just want to make sure we're we're covering anything. So, um, deciduous trees, hardwood trees. Um, we didn't get the, the piece of information from Judy about what species um, Lymantria dispar prefers, but their real preference is for oak. Although they do, um, there are a number of um, species that they do attack. Uh, their preferred is host, host is oak. 
um, but other deciduous and, and also conifer trees some, can sometimes be affected if the populations are high. So um, knowing that this is a defoliator, what's happening is all of the trees um, energy is coming from the roots in the spring. It's putting out all of those, those leaves. And then when it gets eaten, um, the tree really has to dig back down into some of the reserves that it might have to then refoliate. So the impact on an individual tree is there's going to be a reduction in energies, carbohydrates um, that will, because of that surge of, of need. Um, trees can be increased, increasingly vulnerable to other stressors, other insects, other diseases as a result of this defoliation. Um, not again, not every tree is going to experience the same thing. Um, just like you or I, you know, if we're really healthy, we might be able to combat some of these, uh, some of the illnesses we get. Same with trees. Um, you know, some trees have more reserves ready and others uh, might take longer to recover. There's also a growth reduction. And this isn't something that you're going to visibly see, but in studies that have gone on for numbers of years, they, they do show there's a diameter uh, growth reduction, the year of defoliation. And then also there's um, a volume uh, reduction in, in the volume of the tree um, as far as growth is going. Um, they've also found that there's some wood quality impacts, uh, not necessarily, again, the, you know, every, every year the tree puts on rings, um, that sometimes the, the, the difference in the rings can, can do a different quality to the wood. And um, also there's foliar changes. So uh, a tree that's been defoliated, uh, an oak, when it refoliates, those particular leaves are going to be higher in tannins and and phenols, which are basically trying to protect that leaf from being eaten again. So there are definitely some, some physiological kind of changes that are happening that we can't really necessarily see. You might also see um, when the tree refoliates, which, which we hope they will this year. I, I hope the people who are in the Champlain Valley are seeing that. I'm actually in the Northeast Kingdom where I actually haven't uh, experienced uh, firsthand this defoliation event except for what I saw when I did some aerial survey. So um, when it does refoliate, these leaves are also kind of probably be a little smaller than normal. Uh, so that's, that's some of the impacts directly to trees. But uh, I'm gonna jump into some of the impacts potentially of, of forests. Um, so one thing is obviously when the tree is losing all its leaves to being eaten by the caterpillar, um, it's not going to it's not going to really be producing seed this year. So um, most of those oak trees and probably all of them will not produce seed this year. And then they also see that the the, the following year also the, there won't be seed production. And when you think about what that tree's going through, um, that kind of makes sense, right? It's it's trying to refoliate so it can build its factory to be able to make more. Uh, more food and more wood, it's not going to waste that energy necessarily on seed production. Another thing you'll see is um, think about all of those overstory trees, all of those leaves being um, eaten, there's going to be an increased light going down um, to, the, to the forest floor. So what you can have is actually um, it can encourage that shrub layer. So you might get a little more uh, growth in those shrubs that otherwise um, would have been a little more stressed from lack of light. And also that increased light can warm the soil and warm the ground enough to cause some um, more germination of, of seeds that might be down in the ground. So you might actually see an increase of sort of that, that lower layer of, um, of shrubs and, and other um, plants. The other thing is uh, competition. So um, it can actually change, you know, you think of a big oak tree in the overstory, it's got all the space it needs, it's getting all the water, it, you know, it's a, it's a real heavy competitor. Well, if you're kind of knocking it back, it's, it's not as competitive, right? It's not as ready to fight and doesn't have as much, um, you know, stores of, of energy and all of that. So you can actually get a little bit of a reduction in, in the ability of those oaks to compete. Uh, both in the overstory and in the understory. So um, that, that's something to think about. And in situations where um, uh, like a single year of defoliation like this 
generally trees and forests remain pretty healthy. You have a healthy tree, um, it can withstand a single year of defoliation with really very um, limited impact. But when you start getting two or three years of defoliation on that same area, on those same trees, that really does start to impact the health. And you might actually see some tree death. I don't think you're gonna see tree death from a single defoliation unless that tree is extremely, extremely stressed. But in a case where we maybe have two or three years of defoliation and we start to see some branches dying and, and, and maybe even death of trees, that's a, a lot of uh, woody material now that might be landing on the ground. So um, that could also increase the risk of fire over time. Uh, wildlife are also impacted. Um, a couple things um, that we have going on. So this is a good picture of a bear up in an oak tree having a fun time eating the, uh, eating the acorns. Uh, but so wildlife impacts the cover of the wildlife that the wildlife has, the shelter they have, and the food. Um, so again, the, the cover, um, thinking of uh, woody material that might fall to the ground, that's actually could be a positive for some of these smaller animals. Um, that understory growth that I was talking about can actually give a little more cover for, for songbirds and things like that. So this is not always a complete negative impact or, or positive. I think that it depends on what you're what we're looking at um, and some of these things actually do benefit from some level of defoliation. Uh, another thing you might see is uh, an increase in cavities. Uh, if again, if trees are dying or they're getting stressed out by this defoliation, um, you know, you get some snags. And so you might actually have some cavities for the, for the uh, animals. The other thing is food. Uh, obviously this shows a bear eating the acorns. I think we are all aware that Acorns are a very uh, important food for a lot of wildlife species. Deer, bear, birds, squirrels very, very actively eat all of uh, those acorns. And so without, again, that, not just one year, but maybe two years without, without that mast, um, you're going to have a reduction in food. You could also, though, thinking of those woody understory trees, you might actually have some more food down there, but different. Um, Okay, and then lastly of what's being impacted is, is, is the people. Um, here's just a picture of, you know, the debris that is coming down from the trees being defoliated uh, onto, the, onto cars. If you guys live in that area, you're, it's, it's all over your house, it's all over your cars and your outside um, patio equip, uh, furniture. So it's really kind of a nuisance. Um, also, the aesthetics obviously are being impacted. Um, anybody who lives in the Champlain Valley who's probably, you know, seen these defoliated hillsides and just been sort of, <gasps> you know, what's going to happen? It's very shocking. It's not very attractive. Um, and so we, we, we notice it very, very much. They also found um, in past studies that there's a reduction in recreation activity in these areas. Again, when you're recreating, part of it is you know being out in, out in the out of doors, but part of it's being surrounded, I think, by the, the beauty. Um, and if you're going through defoliated stands, it's not really the, the, the vibe you're really looking for. So recreation can also be impacted by this. Um, people's health, I don't know if you're aware, but some people are very highly allergic to those hairs that are on the caterpillar. Um, some people can get respiratory um, Ill illnesses from it as well. And some can get just a kind of a rash and reaction that way. Um, and then just stress, you know, people value their trees. They, they value the yard trees, they value the hillside. And when they're seeing this type of thing uh, that they've never seen before, it's, it's frightening, it's stressful. I've, I've had a lot of calls about, you know, what can I do to save my tree? Um, and usually what I say is, you know, it's, it's a single year and I, I think your tree's going to be okay. You know, in, in most, in most cases, it, it's going to, it's going to withstand this, this thing. There are, however, compounding factors that we have to think about when we think about trees and, and, um, and the forest. So trees in an urban setting are very, you know, they're in a stressful situation. They're probably not getting as much water as they want. They're struggling for space. Um, and, and that could be more susceptible, let's say, to those, those longer term impacts um, or, or 
bigger impacts to the individual tree in those situations. Uh, also trees that are attacked by other pests, um, if they have other diseases or insects that are attacking them, um, those are also compounding factors and could make trees react um, more, more uh, basically be more heavily impacted. Um, also soil, um, I think of some places in the Champlain Valley and they're really rocky, right? Really, really shallow soil. And so those are kind of a stress situation to begin with um, as far as water availability. And then if you're defoliating um, that tree, it's, it's just really tough for it to um, get what it needs to, to remain healthy. Um, and then drought, which um, I think you're probably all aware that this past year and this year, we are in a drought. Um, even though it's been, like we just talked, we talked about earlier, raining for days, um, it's, it's, we're still actually in a drought. And um, that, that is definitely gonna be a compounding factor, I think, in, in this particular um, case. So, what's next? All right, so I wanna talk a little bit about um, basically what we do uh, for monitoring. And one of them is called our focal area plots, um, where we, we, we put in these 125th acre plots um, in previously impacted areas. So basically um, anywhere that probably has a, a good, a good uh, amount of oak, we, we could put a, one of these plots. I think we've got 10 that we have continued to monitor for, for a number of years. Um, and basically this picture is showing what we do is um, basically put a burlap band around it. Um, the gypsy moth will come and lay their, their egg masses underneath that burlap. And then, um, so basically put them up, make sure they're up in the spring. Um, right now the, the, the insects are kind of utilizing those and probably everything else in their, in their area. And then we just go back and count the egg masses and compare them over time to, to see when we might expect um, a defoliation event. So here, here's um, a picture of, this is the egg mass plots that I just described. And this is what we've seen from them over time. And um, let me see, there we go. Um, so on the left is the average number of egg masses per plot. So that's these 10 plots that we take on the left on the bottom, 1986 and all the way up to 2020. And actually if, uh, can you see my mouse when I'm on the screen or no? Yes, uh, we can. Okay. Yep. Good. I can't tell what anybody can see or not see. Um, can you see me messing with that too? Is that in the, anyway. All right, so 19, as uh, Lisa said, 1990, 91 was a big uh, defoliation year. And as you can see, the egg mass count was quite high. Um, we've had a few blips since then, one pretty noticeably in 2005. And then again, um, in 2020, uh, but I just wanna, you know, everybody's like, well, we, there's a big spike in 2020. So we did know that gypsy moth uh, egg mass counts were, were up, uh, but as you see in the past, we've had other blips, which really didn't end up being defoliation events. And um, a lot of that is because of the um, parasites and predators that actually attack the, the um, caterpillar phase. Um, which is something that we, we think of as keeping them in check. But that only happens in wet years. So just to compare, the other, the other slide was actually the egg mass count. This is actually the history of some of the defoliation events from gypsy moth. Um, so you can see here, this is 50,000 acre mark. And that seems to be um, kind of the high end of, of what we've seen in a number of defoliation events, the last one depicted here from 1990. So, let me just, all right. The other thing we do is an aerial detection survey. 
And we do this every year. And I just wanted, I, I know we talk, I've talked about this before in other places and just thought it'd be nice to give people a, an idea of what, what that actually means. Um, and so the map on the right shows these purple lines going up and down the state. Those are spaced four miles apart and they go from the north to the south border. Um, and every year we literally fly those, those lines and we use, it's called a digital sketch mapper and um, handheld device, which actually moves as the plane moves. We're in a plane doing this, obviously. It's a little Cessna, fits about four people. And um, we look out the window and we map um, what we see. And we map not just this particular um, Lymantria disbar, any, everything that we see, we map it and code it. So in 2020, <clears throat> because of COVID, um, we really didn't do the, we did not do the full survey, but we did purposely get up in the air early in the year to try to see, because we saw the egg mass count so high, if there was any defoliation from um, the gypsy moth caterpillar. And really we did not see any in 2020. Uh, so in 2021, again, um, <laughs> as soon as things were happening, we realized, okay, well, we're having a defoliation event now. Um, so we did jump up in the plane on June 23rd and did an, was a, we were able to do an early survey. Um, oh. My slide isn't moving. Oh, there we go. So just to give you an idea, this, this uh, pink line is the, 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 the flight line that we actually flew. The blue line is the representation of that north and south. And then uh, these patches over here are areas that we, we drew while we were flying um, to depict uh, the defoliation. So you can see it's kind of sketchy because of the magnification, but it's all coded. It's a GM for gypsy moth. Defoliation is moderate, you know, and um, that that's what those things mean. So if you if you live if you can recognize that, I have a feeling that's that's probably Colchester, but I'm not positive. But um, that's basically what we're doing when we we do the aerial survey is mark all of these things. And just so just to give you some of the results on the left, this is the 1980 defoliation map. So all of these little black dots are areas that were mapped via aerial survey that year. I believe the total was about 41,000 acres at the highest peak of that um, defoliation event. And here's a one in 1990. And this was a, a higher amount, this is 61,000 acres. But again, you can see it's all along that, that most of it's along that Western border, um, of Vermont, where uh, uh, most of the oak is, you can see a few blips um, down here in the, the southeast. Um, this year, we we only we were only uh, able to get up for one day, but we were able to do the the two or three lines on the eastern part. Of the, I mean, on the western part of the state, and this is what we've mapped so far. We we think we're going to still be able to map it when we get up again, but um, this acre is rough. Uh, acreage this year so far is 51,000 acres. So, um, you know, you can see there's some very, very large uh, areas that we've been mapping and the rest are sort of these small, smaller polygons. Just to give you an idea of what, what it looks like. Um, so we have to be in a plane with the, the wing above us, otherwise we wouldn't be able to see. But this is a good uh, shot looking at, um, looking towards Colchester their pond. I think we're flying north at this time. Uh, so there's a large area of defoliation where you can see it's sort of that brownish red appearance. Another one way over here as well. Um, and then here's one near the St. George Highgate town line. Again, massive amounts of defoliation. So you can look here and look how heavy that is. But when you look in these other areas, it just looks a little sparser. So when we're mapping it, these, these areas over here on the left would be probably a heavy defoliation, whereas over there might be called moderate, where it's not as, um, as heavy and there's a little more green seen in there. And that's a lovely camel's hump in the background. This is uh, another view. This is down in Castleton. And this is, a, I think it's the Blueberry Hill Wildlife Management Area, but again, very, very, very clear, uh, large patches 
throughout the um, visibility there. Oh, looks like Judy's in the waiting room. Um, and the next thing is, well, what can we do? Um, off season, mainly meaning uh, after it's defoliated and, and done all of its damage, um, once the egg masses are laid again later on in the season, <clears throat> you can scrape and just destroy them, um, squish them up if you want. Um, you can also soak egg masses with soap or oil. Um, there's horticultural oil and, and, and soaps made specifically for insects that would be uh, sufficient for that. And then also during the, um, when caterpillars are active, there's a couple things that you can do on the top right. That's a picture of the burlap banding. Um, they're actually very similar to what we put on in our focal area plots. Um, but in this, this, um, in this realm, you're using it more to catch those caterpillars as they're coming up. So they'll be coming up the trees, they'll get caught in that burlap and then you can um, you know, destroy them after that. There's also on the bottom, you can use sticky bands, which, you, which will again, trap those caterpillars. It's very important that you don't wanna get any of that sticky material on the tree itself. That's why people wrap it with some sort of plastic um, to put it on. You can also buy sticky bands as well. And then there's also um, the ability to, for pesticide treatment, um, which we would recommend you get a certified pesticide applicator or arborist um, and arborist to, to be able to do that. And that would be more what I'm talking about is from the ground, a ground application. Um, there are a larger, there are abilities to do um, aerial spraying, but uh, at this point, I don't think the state is, is necessarily going to uh, sponsor that or if, if, if we are, we need some, somebody from uh, the legislature or somebody to get, bring us some money for that because we really don't have any um, ability to do that. So I think that was the end of what I wanted to say um, and just wanted to make you aware that um, the Agency of um, Agriculture and VT and Bases are good sources for information. Um, and just wanted to share those links with you. So that is my portion. And I don't know if Judy made it back or not. Judy um, is back. I'm going to so stop you... sharing my screen. Great. Welcome back, Judy. Hey, great <laughs> job, Kathy. That was exciting. <laughs> I don't know how much you saw, Judy, but... Well, the, the end was great. <laughs> <laughs> Judy, do you want to pick up where you where you left off? Or people, you know, I guess let's see. We still have you know about twenty minutes. Um, okay. If you want to run through that, and then we'll have a little time for questions. Okay, so I have twenty time twenty minutes to talk, or should I curtail it? About fifteen bit? minutes to talk. How about okay, fifteen? Great. Good to know. Well, this will be a high speed tour. Um, cool. Okay, let me share my screen. Thank you. Host disabled participant screen sharing. That doesn't sound good. Oh, give me one second. I will fix that. Much obliged. Patience, everyone. <laughs> like that whole technology. There she is. Great. Oops, nope. Same nope not yet, not yet. Oops, sorry. Okay, now. Try now. Okay, trying now. Way, there we go. Wee. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. Yeah. Okay, let's just make this go like this. Okay, so um, I can't segue smoothly from what Kathy was saying to this, except we'll just go back to the whole thing about outbreaks. So we know Truvelet brought them here. They're defoliators. They do this kind of thing to our woods. It's very disconcerting to, on a summer's day, see trees with no leaves. It's not how things ought to be around here. Um, so, um, the gypsy moth, oops, I knew I was gonna do that. The LDD outbreaks in the past have been somewhat cyclic. And in Vermont, uh, Bruce Parker from the Entomology Research Lab realized that um, they, we would have an outbreak of LDDs every six to 10 years. So that's been about one a decade for the last 80 years. Um, and in 1990, or approximately, um, that was the last outbreak, that was the last aerial spray program for LDD. And thanks to the fungus, we haven't seen them since. But this is also, this graph is to show there's a 
certain amount of synchronicity. So whatever is causing um, the release of the populations from whatever is suppressing them seems to be happening on a regional level. Uh, this is just a map showing the places of the locations of the um, LDD monitoring plots, and perhaps Kathy might have showed you that too, but I thought it was a fun old map to throw in. Um, and my point here is that these, um, these outbreaks that we've seen historically often start from the same place recurrently. Um, so I just want to quickly introduce you to their life cycle, and I'm just going to go over it in an overview and then in a little more detail at high speed. So this is a gypsy moth egg mass. It has the eggs, which you can see one peeking out here, and this hairy outer covering. Uh, this is a, probably about a fourth instar ca caterpillar or larva. Um, so the red dots and the blue dots. Um, a pupil case or a cocoon, as we call them, um, a female. And then um, this is an older egg mass from which the uh, larvae have hatched and left. Um, and I point this out to you because if you see egg masses and you're not sure if it's from this year or the previous year, the fresh ones, if you push against them, are firm and the older ones are softer. So you can tell um, when they showed up or when they were laid, I should say. Um, one thing about uh, LDDs that Kathy might have touched on is that they lay eggs everywhere and often high up in trees so that it's difficult to apply um, an insecticide or physically scrape them off because they're a little hard to reach. Uh, this is just an image of the eggs um, without the hairs on them. And this is showing you the egg masses with the first instar newly hatched larva. These are gonna climb up the tree um, and they're gonna um, produce a silk strand uh, and use that to waft off uh, into the unknown. <laughs> which is usually only 100 to 150 yards, but they can actually go much further than that, um, depending on the wind. And each egg mass contains about uh, 600 to 1,000 eggs, obviously, depending on the size. Um, so this is to show you the relative sizes of the um, larvae. Um, so this is the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. Females have a six instar, males pupate after five. At the fourth instar, um, the caterpillars have a sort of behavioral shift. They will um, usually, they up till then, they had been feeding during the day. But after the fourth instar, they start migrating up and down the trees. They'll um, feed at night and, uh, sorry, um, and then move down the tree and hide during the day. And that's probably to avoid both heat and predation. Um, this is another look at the caterpillars um, to help you distinguish them from other similar looking uh, caterpillars, including the um, morning cloak larvae, which have these red dots and are also spiny, and the eastern and forest tent caterpillars. One way to distinguish um, LDD larvae from lookalikes is that they have these two nodules on the side of their head, and their head has uh, yellow markings on it. So if you look at these, um, this comparison chart with the three insects, you'll see the yellow on the LDD head. Um, I need to keep an eye on the time, I think. So uh, this is a male and female, and the, um, the female is on her egg mass. They don't fly, so she can crawl around a bit, but basically wherever they pupate is where they're gonna emerge and mate and lay their eggs. The males have the plumose antenna for detecting the pheromone trail that the, or the pheromones that the female emits. Um, and they'll fly in a zigzag pattern to try to catch those pheromone trails. Um, I should note that um, the European and Asian LDDs look a lot alike. Um, the Asian form is slightly larger, but the big difference is that the females fly. So if you are looking at these insects and you see something that you think might be a flying female limantrid, if you could either catch it or take a photograph of it and let um, a forest health professional or an entomologist or an extension agent or somebody know, that would be great. We are at risk for these. They can come over on shipping. Um, they have them out in Washington state and they're trying to eradicate them along with the murder hornet. They're kind of busy over there. 
Um, these are the dates of the life cycle. So the eggs hatch late April, early May, depending on temperature some of the time. Um, the caterpillars mold approximately once slower in summer, earlier and faster. Um, so you'll see them finally um, laying eggs and mating, um, you know, end of July, although some of them have laid eggs now, and that seems to me kind of early for our area. Um, so again, might have just depended on the weather. We had a really hot spring before the downpours started. Um, just gonna move along. So some of the things that suppress the populations um, or help curtail population expansion are this whole suite of natural enemies. And you'll notice how many different taxonomic groups uh, these enemies can occur in, including viruses and fungi. Um, and I believe amphibians eat um, LDD sometimes too, although an example doesn't leap to mind. Um, so there's a naturally occurring virus called the nucleopolyhedrosis virus, usually known as NPV. Um, and you can tell when caterpillars have been killed by that one because they're in this V shape or inverted V. It looks like a mustache. And the game changer in the diseases um, and control of LDD, at least in New England, has been the arrival of this Entomophaga mimega fungus. And when the caterpillars are killed by this, they're upside down, their head, this is the head of the lower end. Um, it was introduced at least twice, possibly three times to the US um, deliberately as a biocontrol. And then it wasn't found. So when you introduce biocontrols, you go out in the field and you try to find it and they'd go out and look and they never found it. But in the late eighties, it showed up. It started killing caterpillars and people found out what it was. And um, so we don't really know how it got here, but it's been very effective in suppressing populations. In Vermont, we haven't had an outbreak in 30 years. Um, parasitoids also play a role. So a parasitoid, parasitoid is different from a parasite in that they live in or on the host and they kill the host. Um, they're not just taking a blood meal or something, they're eating it. Uh, there are 12 um, dipterans or flies that are parasitoids of LDDs and about 18 species of wasps. Um, some examples are, there's an egg parasite called Oenceritas cuvani. It has uh, three generations. They're so small, they can only reach the outer layer of the egg masses to parasitize them, um, but they are still can account for 20 to 30% of egg mortality in an egg mass. Um, and then there's this larval parasitoid. Whoops, I did not mean to do that. Thank you. Um, you see the cocoons of the larval parasitoid, Cutesia uh, melanoskella. Um, their first generation is small and attacks the smaller larvae of the LDD, and then the next generation is bigger. Um, the, if you're interested in this, these are two really good websites to go to for more information. Um, this is a tachinid fly called uh, Compsilora consonata, also known as the friendly fly. And it was, again, introduced as a biocontrol, but it wasn't well uh, vetted because it turns out to not be very specific and it in the absence of um, LDDs, we'll go after our big, beautiful moths like the Cercropia moths or the um, Luna moths. So that's been quite unfortunate. Um, and then there are a whole suite of predators. Not everything wants to eat a big, hairy, nasty caterpillar. I should mention that the caterpillar hairs are urticating, so they can irritate. Some people develop a skin rash when they handle them. Apparently, robins aren't among that group. Um, and they're also, um, there's some intricate uh, cycles that have to do with like acorn production and how many mice they are because mice can be an agent in population suppression. But if you have um, smaller mass production, so fewer acorns and other uh, foodstuffs like that, then you have fewer mice and then you might have the release of the LDD population and that might instigate um, an outbreak. Uh, then you have abiotic factors like um, cold weather can kill eggs all, unless the eggs are protected by a snowpack. Um, and we haven't seen a lot of prolonged cold in the state in recent years. Um, wet springs um, are helpful because they help the 
uh, fungi proliferate. So the Entomophaga mimega can um, produce a lot of spores and attack a lot of caterpillars. But um, in this year in particular, we had very dry weather prior to pupation. So the uh, fungus seemed to be in low numbers and we think that's what's responsible for this outbreak after all this time. So um, I think that's all I was gonna tell you, except to say we don't know a lot about Entomophaga mimega. It has been present for 30 years, but at least in Vermont, we haven't seen it um, occurring in conjunction with an outbreak because it's so successfully suppressed the population. So we don't know if next year um, all this rain means we're gonna see the end of the outbreak or if we have to wait for all the natural enemies to work together to suppress a population or um, what's gonna happen. We don't know what kind of fungal load we need to get the LDDs back under control. Um, so I guess that's it. I will stop sharing my screen. Um, Great, my thank you, Judy. Back. Yes. <laughs> I'm glad you made it back. That was awesome. <laughs> um, so we do have one question uh, so far in the chat box. So if anybody has any questions, go ahead and type them in the chat box. We have a few minutes for questions. Um, and uh, the first one is, uh, are the egg masses laid only on live tree bark or will they also be found on down trees or wood chip piles or other items? Well, that's a great question and reminds me of one thing I forgot to mention, which is, yes, gypsy moth, when there are enough of them, they'll lay their eggs on anything. They'll lay their eggs on you if you're not moving fast enough. So um, if you are moving to another state, there, if you could look up the checklist to review, they'll lay their eggs on you know, lawn ornaments, they'll lay them on your furniture, they'll lay them on your cars, on your garbage barrels, on your bird bath. They, they don't discriminate on substrate. So good question. Live wood, dead wood, bark, rocks. So if I want to do something, at least for my yard trees, right? Uh, so at this point, it's scraping the egg masses into soapy water. If I just scrape them off the tree, they'll still hatch. Is that correct? Kathy, did you want to answer that? You're the entomologist, Judy. You can, you can answer. <laughs> okay. Um, they are less likely to hatch because you've removed them from their protective covering, but they could still hatch. Um, you know, it's also easier for something to find them and eat them if they're pulled off a tree and dumped on the ground. But if yeah. you want to make sure that you're taking care of them, then yeah, dump them in soapy water or oil or whatever you want. Squish them till they pop. Yeah, well, I remember we had when I was a kid, we had that we had a beautiful oak tree and we had them sprayed. And when they dropped down and you walked on them, whatever it was, they would pop, 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 pop. It was like popcorn. Yeah, that was interesting. Okay. Um, Sam is wondering if there are any ecosystem ri risks for spraying with BT key, BT, B mm. BTK. <laughs> It seems like a natural. Uh, so they're wondering if there are any risks with spraying BTK. Again, Judy, I might lean on you uh, because I'm not sure how specific BTK is for, is it all Lepidoptera? Is it all, yeah. So yeah, there's definitely gonna be, um, anything Lepidoptera would be susceptible to BTK. So, so that's all your butterflies and moths are in the Lepidoptera yeah. family. Right, although Kathy, if you don't mind that I interject. Yeah. Um, LDDs show up fairly early, so there are not, there's not an enormous suite of other Lepidopterans out there at that time. And it's really only the second instars that are most susceptible. So there's some timing involved that helps protect other Lepidopterans, but it, it is a risk. Do we think next year is going to be uh, a greater defoliation than even this year. I mean, I saw many, many more um, caterpillars this year. I'd seen them the year before and I saw egg masses the year before, but uh, there's a huge defoliation where I am and now there are even more egg masses on the trees. So should we expect a larger defoliation next year? Like how long does the cycle of the boom and the bust last? 
I think a lot of it depends on, again, the, the weather and the impact of these, these, these predators, parasites, parasites, parasitoids. Um, I think if, uh, if, if it was the same weather situation that we're experiencing this year, I think, yes, we will probably see defoliation um, because of just the amount of, like you're saying, egg masses are showing up everywhere, um, even where people didn't see them last year or the year before. So, um, but again, as Judy mentioned, what's the impact of this rain now? Uh, what's the weather going to be next spring when, when these um, larvae are hatching? And, and, you know, I really just hope that there'll be enough rain to encourage those, um, the fungus and, and get that virus doing its thing. And um, hopefully we won't see it, but it wouldn't surprise me. Judy, you have anything to add? Oh, oh I, think, I think we just lost her. I think we lost Judy. So yeah, that's, that's really the, you know, it's, it's not, it's, it's not as simple as like, oh, yep, it's high. So we're going to see it again, but there's definitely a lot of egg masses out there. So it would not surprise me to see defoliation again. Okay. Um, and any other questions uh, for our speakers tonight? I'll leave the chat box open for another minute or so. Um, I know I've really learned a lot tonight um, and I've been doing a lot of research because they are here and they were bothering me and I was getting a lot of questions from landowners, which is why we decided to do this. What we hope to do again is in uh, spring, kind of when they're coming out next year, is to do another program just to sort of where are we at, um, a reminder for those who didn't know, uh, you know, because people are going to get panicky again next spring. So we'll hope to do this again in the spring. Uh, with maybe some new information on the expectations for the outbreak. So stay tuned, everybody, for that as well. Yeah, I mean, we, you know, we'll have more information. We'll have egg mass counts from this fall, uh, things like that to help us uh, kind of figure out where we're going or what's going to happen. Yep. So Michael asked about foliar damage. Is that less lethal than vascular damage? Um, generally, yes. Um, I, it actually, when, when I saw that question, it made me think of another thing I, I might not have pointed out. Um, um, so yeah, and, and when the foliar damage happens or when the defoliation happens is also important, um, you know, uh, for whether a tree can, is able to refoliate. But I just want to take a side note of, I mentioned that it also defoliates conifers in when the populations are high. We have seen that in this event. I've had plenty of people say that it's, it's eating my pine tree. Um, those trees will not recover very well if they recover at all. And that has to do with, again, where those stores of the energy is held in a conifer is in the needles. So once those stores are gone, the tree really doesn't have a lot of energy to draw on to refoliate. So um, a defoliation event is more impactful to a softwood or conifer than it is um, a deciduous tree. That's a good question. Is LDD less damaging than EAV? <laughs> question. Um, I would say something like EAB, which once it's in a tree, is, is going to most likely kill that tree that that is more damaging than a defoliated. It's also different species that are really kind of impacted, right? right? We said, you know, gypsy yeah. moths really love oak. They'll eat anything pretty much, but the EAB is very specific to our white, strictly our black. Ash. Yeah, strictly ash, yeah. all the ash. Yeah. So interesting. All right. Yep. And Sam notes, you mentioned that the leaves grow back tougher. Will that allow the leaves to endure an LDD onslaught next year? Well, again, I think I said they're, you know, they're, they've got tannins and they've got these, these phenols in it, which are really meant to be distasteful to anything that eats the foliage. Um, I, I think it really depends on volume of, of the insect. Um, if there's enough, just like we've seen this year, they'll, they'll eat anything. So they'll, they'll probably still eat um, un, untasteful leaves or uh, <laughs> But again, that, that's the tree's defense. It's trying, trying what it can to keep it off. So one of the things that everybody should think about is forest resiliency. What we really want is to create a healthy forest uh, with a lot of different age classes so that we can handle these kinds of outbreaks, whether it be EAB, LDD, um, these threats, climate, 
are all threats to our forests. And so we need to be really conscious of, of their management and care so that we can withstand these, these onslaught of attacks. Um, so the, the more healthy the forest, the more resilient the forest, the better the forest is able to handle these kinds of attacks. Yeah, and I just want to add to that. I mean, diversity is is really um, a key component too. We we found in other um, defoliators like Forest Tent Caterpillar, the more diverse forest you have, really the less kind of impact it has because it just doesn't have as much of the the food that it desires. Um, so yeah, again, healthy healthy trees, healthy forests are going to be able to withstand um, these types of events much much more than um, stressed situations for sure. Before I jumped on tonight, um, they had the Wildlife Watch on uh, WCAX, and uh, they were highlighting the Hinesburg Town Forest, where there's a lot of forest management that's been going on. And they recently put out signs that talk about the importance of ecological forestry and different age classes and a healthy forest that I think they said there are 12 signs throughout the, uh, the walk. It's a self-guided tour, and you, there's QR codes. So it's a great place to learn about some different forest management techniques that are, are working to create a resilient, healthy forest. And uh, there's a lot of town forests out there that are also doing management. So uh, if you need some examples of those kinds of things, uh, let us know. Looks like we have Judy back again, yay. <laughs> I am gonna say, it looks like uh, all the questions have been answered. It's eight o'clock. Um, I know it's still storming in some places. So I'm gonna let you all uh, get off your computers. I hope you all have a great evening, have learned something. Uh, go ahead and sign up for our e-news uh, and uh, email us with any additional questions and we will certainly do our best to answer those. Judy, Kathy, thank you so much for joining us tonight. You're welcome. Thanks for inviting me. And yeah, our total pleasure to be here and great questions from everyone. All right. Thank you. Good night.